Okay? So that's a very important part. Without any further delay, Ashley is going to be our student introducer. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Colbert. And today I would like to introduce to you guys Mac, who attended the College of Charleston, Mick, who attended the Art Institute, and Brandon, who attended Newberry. Together, these gentlemen work on changing how people think about soda. So they uh, work with a local uh, farm where they can see where their products come from and also see the process from start to finish. Quality and craft is really important to them. They want to make sure that no matter how successful their business gets, that quality remains to be number one. So please help me in welcoming Matt, Nick, and Brandon. Of, of being able to make my own money. Um, 
later on, um, I went to Newberry to play soccer uh, and spent a year there and then went to Trident. Um, and I think the, in the beginning of our business before we started, we were working in restaurants, I always thought that I'd be building, uh, inventing things. Like, I remember uh, I asked Mick for his help one time trying to uh, conceptualize an idea that I had. Um, I just like seeing something from the beginning to like taking an idea and then building it that has a purpose, and then trying to get it to the market. Um, so somewhere in the middle of that, uh, Nick and Matt asked me if I'd like to start this company, uh, and I was 100% in since day one. So. so I'll tell you a little bit about how we started the business. Um, we were all living together on Cannon Street. Um, and it was around 2012, Matt had just graduated college, uh, I just graduated culinary school, Brandon and I were working in some uh, high-end bars in town, um, we actually helped open the gym joint, um, so that really gave us a, I, I had you know, dreams to cook, but then kind of really fell in love with the bar uh, as the craft cocktail movement was really kicking off in Charleston. So we were kept working in restaurants and eating out at restaurants, we were really exposed to some really interesting things happening in food. And as Matt said, we were interested in doing something. Uh, we didn't have a ton of capital to start, so we knew it needed to be something kind of small, something we could build up with, and a food truck or, or something similar made a lot of sense. There was a lot of competition for food trucks, and we wanted to do something, it made sense to do something complimentary. And seeing all the interesting things that were happening in food, beverage, we noticed that there was amazing cocktails, amazing wine, amazing beer being made in town, but there was nothing interesting happening with non-alcoholic beverages. So we kind of used the training that we uh, got behind the bar and started coming up with different ideas to make a non-alcoholic beverage that, took this, that had the same attention to detail, care, um, ingredient focus, quality sourcing um, to, to come up with that. And one of the things we found is that soda reminded us a lot of beer before the craft beer movement. Um, soda was, the, the market was controlled by a couple big players, there was no creativity, very stagnant, and, and you know, people weren't drinking soda. So we saw it as an opportunity to, to improve that, and taking a lot of inspiration from local restaurants who were working with local farms and sourcing really interesting ingredients and comparing them in interesting ways, we started making the first sodas. And the first uh, few batches we made in a soda stream at our house, and the, uh, the farmer's market was coming up, the applications for that was, was on the way, and we said, you know, we don't have it all figured out yet, but let's just apply, the worst that happens is we don't get it. So we applied, they liked the idea, and we had to do a, kind of a, a demo day. Everybody set up their booths, and a team of judges walked by and tried uh, everybody's uh, offerings. And at this point, we didn't realize we didn't know how to make a batch bigger than like, you know, 32 ounces. And so we were accepted and then we had to very quickly, within two weeks, figure out how to go from tiny batches to, to big batches. And so that was kind of the first big hurdle for us, but it was very exciting to, to really have to figure it out. Um, so we did a lot of Googling, a lot of YouTube tutorials, and uh, looked to, because we were making soda in a way that hadn't really been done before, um, we, had to get creative and look to other industries who were doing similar things. So we looked to the beer industry, we looked to uh, tea makers, we looked to the wine industry, anybody that we could, that was working with liquids that we could emulate, and we, we figured it out. So we started at the farmer's market, and we began selling the sodas by the glass. And this was, uh, this was a great way for us to build capital, but one of the unintended consequences that really benefited us was having a test market where we could get feedback immediately from people. And over the first two years, our, our sodas changed a lot. We had an idea of what we thought people wanted, and people were very open with their feedback. And we took that and we changed the product, and tweaked it, and tweaked it, um, until we got to a point where people were really happy with it. And we knew we had a product that people wanted. And this was about the point where uh, restaurants started to catch wind of what we were doing because it was in kegs and they uh, reached out and wanted to offer our soda in their restaurants. And at this point, we were still making it at our house in Cannon Street, um, a little under the radar. 
but we knew if we were going to offer it to restaurants, we had to really get legit with it and figure out uh, how to do it the right way. So at this point, we um, reached out to some friends and started uh, asking anybody we could if we could use their space after hours. And one of the first places we started doing it was uh, at Andalini's, which is now Basic Kitchen. Um, we used to go in at night and brew um, once the restaurant closed, and then wake up and, and go to our jobs after that. And uh, hold up, Brandon. Yeah, so I'm not sure which direction Andalini's was from here. Basic Kitchen, that way? Yeah. Yeah, so like right there. Uh, there was a uh, social wine bar. Uh, first started out of, I don't even think we could actually use their kitchen. And then by the time uh, we really needed to have a, a real test kitchen, we outgrew making it at our place. Um, Andalini's, I was actually making pizza there, so it worked uh, during the day. And then we would close down, make product all night. And then there were a few times where then I would have to open back up in the morning. But it's just kind of finding, finding a place to make your dream work. Like, find a place that will allow you to to start up with without having to spend too much money. And the, the owner of Andalini's was really nice and uh, let us use the space for a while. Uh, then we got to the point where when we were selling to the restaurants, uh, we asked the uh, our regulatory, uh, I think this is a big point, is if you're making a food product, make sure that you stay very close in touch with the uh, the people who are regulating you. Um, make sure that they don't think that you're trying to, to get by without talking to them, or then you'll, you'll run into a lot of hurdles later on if they don't think they're right there alongside you. Um, and that probably goes for a lot of different industries as well. Um, they are definitely there to help you unless you're holding back information, and then they're there to not help you. But, um, so, we try to, we, uh, Westbrook Brewery wanted to put us in their tap room, um, as well as like Edmonds O's, and then there was Lily's Hot Kitchen, all at the same time. And we hadn't really thought of, uh, we hadn't really thought that far yet. Uh, and as soon as they reached out and asked us if we could put them in there, it was like, of course, we'd definitely do that. We'd love to. Um, so we asked DHEC what we should do. Um, they said we needed, needed our own place, so we had to move out of Mandalini's. Um, but they allowed us, it was because of like cross-contamination of like food ingredients and fruits. And you, don't want a, you don't want parts of pizza going into the soda. Uh, so we asked them if it was okay if we, uh, if we found another beverage company to split a space with. And there was, I'm not sure if any of y'all are familiar with Rocky Beer Brewing, um, but we saw a really cool opportunity to, uh, one, learn how to use the equipment that the breweries were using, because we knew that that was the route to scaling up. Uh, but two, like, one, learn from them, two, see it in operation, and then three, be able to use the space as a transitional space before we got our own. Um, and so Frothy let us move in with them uh, for about a year, I would imagine where we started buying our first like legitimate equipment um, and we're using homebrew style kegs um, and distributing ourselves. So we would literally, at the end of the week, we take orders um, and then just distribute across the state in a minivan that we have. Um, just drive around, <coughs> drop them off, pick up empty kegs. Um, and all of that was cool up until you have more kegs than you can deliver in a single day and then it becomes multiple days. Um, we had to start looking for a distribution partner. Um, and I think that's another big thing, is, is being able to focus on what your focus is and, and finding the other places where you can find somebody else to, to do the heavy lifting for you, literally. Um, and for us, uh, one of the first <coughs> big ones was, was finding a distribution partner to be able to, like, yes, you do have to pay them, but that's what they specialize in. And unless you want to happen to come from the distribution background or you want to start a distribution company, it's a good idea to, to offload that on somebody else um, who specializes in it. Uh, so from there, uh, we 
saved up enough money at that point, um, once we got a distributor to, to start thinking about our own space. Um, we moved right around the corner from where their old facility used to be in North Charleston. Um, that's where we still are today. Uh, but we, it's kind of when we started thinking about not only doing tags, but uh, we wanted to, to test something in a retail market with a bottle. Uh, the equipment to bottle in a 12 ounce, like the one that you see here, is really expensive. Um, canning equipment being even more expensive. Uh, so we set out to try to build our own. Um, that's a lot of, of what we do. If you uh, you're you're welcome to if you get in touch with us, come out and check out our facility. It's really interesting. Uh, we figure out a way to kind of uh, piece between the the startup equipment and big scale equipment. Uh, we're right there at the point where we're going to need to start getting bigger scale equipment now. But we try to build our own. Uh, bottling line, and so that we can start doing 750 milliliter champagne bottles, which was a perfect way to, it wasn't all the way to the goal of a 12 ounce bottle, but it was a really good way to show the, uh, how our product is shareable. It's like an experience to, for when you're with your friends and you want to, uh, it's something that, it's an experience. Uh, and that's what the, the champagne bottle really uh, showed for us. So from there, we need to go into, um, with, the, with the distributor that we had, um, we were with them for about three, four, five months. And there was a, uh, we were in the beer distribution model, which just happens to have a different refrigeration level than what is a food food grade uh, refrigeration level. So we ran into a fermentation issue, which we had never thought about that could have been an issue before. Uh, sugar in our soda and yeast in, in the air that's in the product actually ferments, creating alcohol. And then we started finding out about that a few months later. And uh, so we had to break from our distribution partner and go back to self-distribution, which was not fun. But uh, then we set out to try to make a try to figure out how to make our product shelf stable. Uh, that's kind of where we where I'll pass this off to Matt. Thanks. So the the champagne bottles were were awesome. Um, they got us into another market. Um, they allowed us to launch into other states. So we quickly got distribution into Georgia and Tennessee and North Carolina. And that that was awesome. We got some great press around the bottles and they did really well in South Carolina, but they did not do well in the other places. So we were kind of realized this is a problem. We were making a little bit of money, but we knew in order to scale effectively, we were going to have to pivot and we do this, um, figure out how to do this um, quickly, get the money to do it, and we need to get to a smaller format bottle which could be placed anywhere. Place at grocery stores, and it's kind of like all the feedback we're getting to say, hey, do this. So as we we're struggling to do this, we sort of caught a big break. We had actually a huge order from a grocery store in Texas called Central Market, and that sort of came out of nowhere, they wanted a bunch of soda. They wanted 18 pallets, and, which was fantastic. We didn't know how to make that much soda. We had never made a small bottle before. We had about a month and a half to do it, and we didn't have the money to do it. So we made a lot of phone calls at this point, uh, a lot of 16-hour days, a lot of calling literally every person I know about how to do this. Hey, where do I get this piece of packaging? packaging material who can bottle the soda for us and we found a mobile bottler who could come in and sort of use his equipment to, to bottle it in small, smaller batches and do it quickly. We found the money, we sort of begged, honestly begged Brandon's dad to, to give us a loan to, to get us through this, that, that period of our, our life and we got the order out the door and we felt really good about ourselves. Um, from that point on, we launched 
those laws <coughs> into even more states, um, maybe like six states then, something like that. And they were doing pretty well. They were getting reorders from out of state, which was something that was pretty exciting. Um, and it was doing well in South Carolina. But at that point, we <coughs> lost one of our biggest customers due to sort of a technical issue to his Whole Foods. Um, they said that it was a, a new product because we, swim, we transitioned from a large bottle to a small bottle. So we lost our biggest customer and we're like expecting, hey, we're gonna grow with Whole Foods and then we were not able to right away and sort of scrambling, asking a lot of questions of ourselves, like where, where do we go from here? So I think from here, persistence sort of paid off. Uh, Brandon sort of, we just kept on <coughs> at it and we got through and they ended up being awesome. They, instead of being in all the South Carolina stores, they said, hey, we're gonna put you in every store in the Southeast. So awesome, we got into sort of more of the grocery game. We got a distributor who specializes in that sort of thing. I said, hey, since Whole Foods is doing this, this distributor will do this for us now, and then other grocery stores can't pick up a product from that distributor. So we got some connections to get a broker, a sales broker, who has since gotten us into um, of course, the last 18 months into all the fresh markets, and there's 160 stores in 22 states, and into all the Harris Teeters starting in November. So that is where we're at right now, and our, our heads are time spinning trying to figure out how to, how to do all that in the next couple <coughs> months. Um, one thing I feel like glossed over is the product itself. How many of you guys are familiar with the product or have seen the product before? A couple people, cool. Um, so we, it's an all-natural fresh fruit soda. Uh, we um, take fresh fruits, fresh fruits, we try to pair a single fruit with a single aromatic and combine them in interesting ways. And uh, the, it's great on its own, but it's primarily, a lot of people use it as a mixer. Um, cocktail mixer, really easy cocktail mixer. And so we make it all by hand. Figure out from our prescriptions, but typically for um, a lot of beverages, you're going to build a product and then co pack that, have another co packer make that for you, another manufacturing facility. You build that, and then you're focused on marketing the product, the product. And for us, making such a unique product um, that required us building up our own facility and kind of all the things that we did that overall work. Um, but as far as tips um, go, I think one of the biggest ones that uh, we've learned. One of the ones that's most important to me is definitely the idea of um, proof of concept, uh, making small steps to test the waters before going all in on something. Um, it, it, you know, we've, we've burned ourselves by not doing that. We've seen a lot of success by doing that. And I spoke about it a little bit with the farmer's market. That's probably the greatest example. Um, we didn't have a ton of capital when we started out. I think we all saved up like one paycheck and all dumped it in, and that was what we started with. And uh, starting at the farmer's market was very low risk for us capital, uh, from a capital perspective. And if it didn't work, you know, no worries, we'll, we'll try the next thing. Um, but it also allowed us to kind of take those baby steps and uh, get that feedback, tweak the product, and really get uh, validation of the product before investing and moving too far ahead of ourselves. So that's definitely a big one is uh, figure out ways that you can make those proof of concept tests and validate it for us for uh, the same time. We talk about setting goals. Um, I think when we first started our company, we were uh, just trying to see where it goes. And a lot of times, um, we didn't have any direction. We were, it wasn't really a bad thing. It's kind of be expected. Three young guys all working other jobs trying to make it make it happen um, but we to get to any sort of growth spurt, growth spurt or to get through the ceiling it took a lot of planning um, especially short spurts and long spurts to sort of realize what our vision was and once we had the correct 
vision, we were all together on the same page, making it happen that day. That happened when we were putting together a production facility, when we got that order out the door to Central Market, and we get better at it every single day. Uh, so one of the things I think is most important is finding uh, finding people to bounce things off of, finding mentors. Uh, every, everybody says that, and you're just like, yeah, well, I know what I'm doing. And you probably do, to be honest. But it's a lot easier when there are other people. Uh, you find somebody that you actually respect, somebody, uh, and multiple people, so that you can take, even if you do feel fully 100% in your ideas, at least be able to bounce them off of somebody else that can see it from a different angle, uh, and then run it back through the filter of your business. Does what everybody else said, like put it together, does all of that, what out of all of that makes sense back through my brain, wait, Nick's brain, Matt's brain, how does it, how does it go back through our business filter? Um, and then you might scrap it all, but Chances are, 99% of the time, you're gonna find something really interesting by bouncing it off of somebody else. So it's just find, find a team of people, and it, they don't all have to be a group of people that you get together, um, but on a, on a daily basis, I'm, I'm bouncing five to 10 ideas off of 10 to 20 people. So it's, uh, and then you can make a decision a lot more easily. And then every day, you get better at making those decisions and the same style of decision that, that you just made will be a lot easier to make the next time you run into it. Uh, you'll see a lot of the same things kind of coming back up. But as you're, as you're growing, we didn't know how to run a, a retail company. In, in the beginning, we didn't even know how to make the product that we were making. Um, so it's all about just finding somebody who does. It'll save yourself a lot of time because Google is a different, difficult place to search, it will just give you the, the feedback on what you already know. Like all the algorithms point back to what it thinks you want to know. If you're trying to learn something new, it's really difficult to do. So find somebody else that does. Cool. cool. And uh, lastly, I think it's really important. Um, setting goals is important, but also just important to, in terms of keeping your sanity, is to enjoy the ride. If you just focus on where you're going, you'll sort of miss out on how you got there. And I think I can, something I try to we try to do today, but kind of hard to do when you're in the weeds and you're trying to figure out the next step when you're, you're under the gun. But a lot of people would kill for the opportunity that that you have, and I think that it's good to keep that in mind. Just that this is a, a very <coughs> Uh, on the, the whole thing is the entrepreneurial uh, mindset and uh, I think something that was stated earlier was about a pivot and I used to think that a pivot was a complete go in the opposite direction when you run into a problem uh, and I think that and what Matt said a little bit earlier is that we made a pivot into our, our small bottles so I need to do that. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a part of what we were trying to do in the end. We just saw a need to do it right then and there and had to do it and had an opportunity to do it, to move into 12 ounce bottles. So a pivot doesn't have to be a turnaround and run the other way. It can be a, like, we still sell kegs. We still, uh, we were still doing farmer's markets a couple years after that. Uh, so, <coughs> You can continue doing things and also make small pivots in positive directions. Uh, and that was something that I learned uh, that, that a pivot's not a, a complete business change. Always. I'm sure there are plenty of cases that it makes sense, but that was something that I saw. The last thing, um, and probably the most important thing, is always have enough cash. Um, I think we wish we would have. Something we struggled with like the entire time we were doing this is where to come up with money. So, very hard question to answer a lot of times, but I think if you ever have the opportunity to have more, get it. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think we're ready for, for questions.
Sure. If you could repeat the question so that just for the recording, so whenever somebody asks a question, if you could repeat it for everybody, it would be great. Sure. Okay. You used, I, I really like the word uh, business filter. I think that's like, not to be fluffy, but like the cutest thing I've ever heard in business terms. Um, and I was wondering, what is your personal definition of that? The question is, what is our personal definition of a business filter? It's nobody knows your business as well as you do, so you're going to get a lot of input um, from people who know a lot about the industry or or the things that you don't know, but they don't know what you know about your business. And so the business filter to me is is all the things that you know that nobody else knows about your business. Yeah. And and also your filter needs to have the I can be wrong in it as well. But uh, so just probably exactly like you just said, this if you're reaching out for advice and us as a beverage company, if we ask a, make something up, if we ask a cheese company, we're like, that's the same thing. It's like they're in the it's a question about grocery, it's a question about distribution, it's a question about how to deal with the buyer. If we ask the cheese company, they'll have the right answer. And then they tell you something and you're like, but that's not how it works in my industry. You can't just take their advice and run with it if you do happen to know things are slightly different in your industry. So then you say, okay, that this is their answer, this is what they said. And then ask somebody that's, if you can find somebody that's the exact opposite of what the cheese company is from you as well, then you can kind of triangulate an answer based on what you know about your industry and how those two industries are slightly different from each other. You might be able to find the right answer in there. Hopefully. Guys? What would you have done differently if you do it all again? What would we have done differently if we could do it all again? Oh, man. Um, I'd say right off the rip, I would have started with an uncarbonated product we would have been involved a lot faster. But it was the right move going the, going the direction we did. I think, too, kind of on your last point, uh, raising money sooner. I think we were um, having no entrepreneurial experience when we started and really learning as we go. Um, I think we were really nervous to take uh, <coughs> capital, to take investment, um, because you know, if something went wrong, it's just our time and our cash and taking somebody else's time to intimidate us. But I think we would have been able to, if, had we taken investment earlier, we could grown a lot faster. And, um, maybe it's a little bit better. Yeah, I think um, what we have done differently really is maybe, like all of those points, I think we didn't really start doing them until later on when we started the company. So I would have asked a lot more questions first. I would have been talking to every single person I know without any sort of embarrassment or shame or them rejecting me. I would have been, would have been getting everyone together, setting goals, um, getting around the same page a lot sooner, um, and then taking that information to get the best plan to get the, the right capital that we needed to, to really move things forward. Okay. Um, the sooner that you can get somebody to help you and then give you back the time that you need to actually grow the business. Um, I think that we would have uh, hired some production help a little bit earlier if we could have. Um, but I think everything played out, we learned the things that we that we know now and we're gonna continue to learn plenty more in past today, but um, at exactly when we would have learned it. It was, we basically were, were shown the problem right in front of our faces and, and had to make a decision um, and we hire uh, some production help that then gives us more time to run the business at the exact same time that Whole Foods wants to put us in 44 stores. And, um, so, yeah, just like Matt said, you know, all the things that we were our big points, if we could have just learned them a little bit earlier. The question was, at what point do we start becoming profitable? Um, so we have gone in, in and out of profitability, uh, to be honest, um, based on decisions that we've made to 
for the cup eight at points where we expanded and, um, and and things like that instead of taking us out for getting us back to the point where we can grow bigger and get each other out. So we were it was really, I would say it was a lot easier at the start when we were just not paying ourselves and we were selling it at the farmers market and I know Do you guys wish that you planned more whenever or planned more long term when you first started, or do you suggest just kind of, you know, winging it? The question is, do we wish we would have uh, planned, planned more when we first started, um, or sort of push that down the road? Is that a great question? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Um, I think it's a it's a balancing act for sure. I, there's there's definitely things that I wish that we had just done, you know, and not labor as much as we did. I think there was, especially in the beginning, a little bit of analysis paralysis, a lot of time in the library just kind of building the business plan and figuring everything out. And then, you know, six months later, all that's out the window anyway. But at the same time, I wouldn't recommend just going full steam ahead um, and without any plan. I think um, plan, but know that that plan is definitely going to change. But don't get so caught up in planning that you're not going to first steps. And I think to go back to the, the proof of concept, if there's ways that you can make a little test, like if you have a, a product you can prototype and sell you know, on an Etsy store or Instagram, or if you have a service that you can um, give to your friends for free and, and get feedback, any way that you can kind of prove, prove the concept, validate it, and, and iterate on it is, is really helpful. Um, I know you mentioned that you felt there was uh, so like a not very competitive market in terms of the type of products that you you were thinking about making specifically in Charleston. When you started making this product, did you um, did you feel that way like throughout the United States or throughout the world, or were you looking at the immediate moment of starting in Charleston? The question was that for sort of the competition that we just felt there wasn't much in your asking if that was for just Charleston or throughout the country and the world. Exactly. Cool. Um, I think that it's both, definitely. I think there's a few players sort of around. Definitely not in Charleston when we started. There was really nothing. We were like the first craft, non-alcoholic company, non-alcoholic beverage company, I think. Um, in this area. Yeah, in this area. Um, there's definitely something that's sprouted up, which we're really, really happy about. Um, and throughout the world, there were definitely some, but it definitely wasn't a movement, and we could sort of see that it was sort of starting to be a movement. It was something that we're seeing, but we didn't really view it as competition, we viewed it as something that's happening. That makes any sense. Um, when we first came up with the idea, we were definitely looking bigger than just Charleston, um, you know, especially kind of looking at the craft beverage industry or the, the beverage industry as a whole, <coughs> similar to the beer industry for the craft movement, we kind of saw those things. And so we knew it was something that Charleston would appreciate. And we knew if, we, if Charleston could appreciate it, then we could expand that out. And we saw, uh, especially in like restaurants and bars, there was this shift, um, a lot of people call it the barber table movement, but there's a shift towards more fresh ingredients and uh, more balanced uh, culinary focused food and beverage. And we weren't seeing this on the retail shelf, so it was always our intention to take this to retail. Um, and everything was kind of a stepping stone to that. So I think to, to answer your question, yeah, um, we didn't see really any competition from the highest level down. So it kind of was a good idea for you. Um, and, and we saw ourselves as a like the craft beer industry uh, didn't become the craft beer industry without now probably way off on this number of 4,000 craft breweries now. Um, they wouldn't have gotten to that size had there not been 4,000 of them. And then enough people to actually make that a, a segment of the, of the beverage world. Um, and we saw the companies that were around whenever we did start, it was like there was one in California and one in New York. We were like, we're the one in the South. Um, and now as it, more and more beverage companies like us start up. Look, this is awesome. This is awesome. There's finally a movement. Um, and what we're telling the grocery stores now is like, 
the, the soda set doesn't have to look like what it looks like right now, we actually see it looking more like the craft beer set. So, uh, and you can, we actually have a vision for them. Um, so we're, we're trying to, the more competition in our segment, the better. There was a question here. Uh, Jeff, I know you guys said you had a lot of demand. Say that one more time. Uh, I know you guys have like a lot of demand, but how else do you like market your product to get it out there? Um, the question was, uh, how do we market our product and get it out there? Um, it's been a lot of word of mouth for us. I think the, in the beginning, the farmers market was huge for us because we had locals and a lot of tourists coming by, and we worked really hard to set our booth apart at the farmers market. So we wore soda jerk outfits with bow ties and, and paper hats. And um, we had a giant tap wall. So we worked really hard to create a you know, visually interesting booth that people wanted to stop by and at least ask what it was. Um, so that was kind of the first thing. Reaching out to local press to start and securing a little bit of local press really helped. That's what got the restaurants interested. And uh, then once we had some restaurant accounts, they were actually acting as kind of ambassadors for our product because when our product is on tap, it's a really easy mixer for restaurants. Um, and so they have an incentive to kind of push that. Um, they can make the cocktails quick and cheap, but they're still delicious and very high quality. Um, so we've had a lot of people saying, oh, I had it at Edmund's Oast. Um, you know, where can I get it elsewhere? So, um, so there was that. Uh, the local press kind of, when we had a handful of local press, that allowed us to reach to regional press and just kind of build up from there. Um, eventually, uh, when national press was starting to hear about craft soda as a movement and things that were happening, um, because we had that smaller press, uh, that kind of brought us up to the top, and so we were able to get in um, USA Today and, and uh, Food Network Magazine and some, some really cool press, um, you know, just from the foundation that we built. And outside of that, it's uh, been a, a lot of just really hard, or heavy word of mouth. We do a lot of donations to um, local charity events. Any, again, because it's a cocktail mixer, um, any event that um, could use a, a good mixer, we, we will donate that and it helps them out and it helps us out getting us uh, getting them out there. So really kind of real stuff. We have had the budget to like, invest a ton into traditional advertising, so we've had to get really creative with it. And also, it, depending on how much you believe in the product or service that you have, um, put yourself out there. Uh, a big came to us and was like, the, the, the yogurt company, Chobani, had an incubator program that they were running. And Mick was like, we can, we can win this thing. And so we made a video, just a, a short, fun little video, and sent it to the Chobani incubator program. And we were one of the eight companies this year that they brought in for uh, out of 600 brands. And it was just because we believed in what we were doing. The concept works, and they bought into it as well. Um, they brought us into their, their program. How has y'all's experience been trying to get people to spend extra money on a product that's so crazy? The question is, how has it been trying to get people to spend money on soda, which is traditionally a commodity type of item? I think um, that's an awesome question, and it has definitely been really hard. But I think the good thing about our product is that it actually is really good. So at the farmer's market, we were able to get a lot of free samples, a lot of sampling, a lot of demos, a lot of getting people to try it. And I can't really express that enough, just us being really almost borderline aggressive trying to be like, hey, you need to try this product. And they'll say, I don't like soda, I don't drink soda. And I'm like, just try it, and they'll drink it. And they're like, oh, that's really good. And they're like, that's not really like soda. I'm like, we well, you know. So that is kind of really the key. Yeah, I think it was a lot of really, really hard work, a lot of, I can't tell you how many people I've had tasted. I don't know. How many people bring? 
72. 72. 72, that's it. Yeah. Possibly at the end. Possibly at the end. How do you draw like balance between like, walk the line between like a great opportunity and then like getting way over your heads? Oh. <laughs> We're in over our heads. <laughs> <laughs> the question is how you balance the line between a great opportunity and getting in over your heads. And I think for us, um, I don't know if I'd recommend this, but I think our our you know what we've done is we if, if we weren't feeling it over our heads, then we knew we weren't really as prepared as fast as we should be. Um, it's definitely been difficult sometimes, but um, if you're comfortable and you're feeling you know, like everything's good, then you're probably going to be comfortable hard enough. At least that's that's how we approach it. And um, I think a lot of opportunities we weren't ready for, and it was just, okay, we're either going to figure this out or we're not, and we just had to figure them out. And, yeah, a lot of sleepless nights, but, but definitely. Good. So it, it's difficult. I, I don't know how to say exactly how to balance that because I don't think we've been great at it. We've just been kind of in and over it. So, yeah. Yeah, Pam, I mean, I was just going to same exact thing, really. The, if you ever do catch up, you're probably a little behind. So just be able to. to live in a little bit of an uncomfortable zone, um, I think that that's the best advice. Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, what was the process in of the product design with the logos? So um, we have a, a good friend who does a lot of our graphic design work, and um, we worked with him, and the 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 big concept behind it was we wanted it to be reminiscent of soda bottles, um, vintage you know, retro soda bottles, but still feel new and fresh. Um, especially, we took a lot of time to look at what was already on the shelf and think of ways that we could be in stark contrast to that. So um, it's it's very uh, it's two colors, very bright colors, um, very clean design, clean lines, um, and the characters themselves were. When we were looking through uh, soda bottles from you know, the, the early 1900s, um, we were seeing a lot of characters, a lot of um, you know, almost cartoon-like things. We wanted, we wanted to hearken to that, but still have it look pretty modern. And the, the characters themselves, we were dressing as soda jerks um, for the farmer's market food, so we wanted to you know, play that up as well. And so we came with, up with the idea of actually creating uh, character mascots, and they all represent us. Um, Brandon's the squirrel on the raccoon, that's the mouse. And uh, yeah, and because we were making in Canterbury, Canterbury, the name itself, um, comes from the neighborhood that we were living in when we started the company, but really we were inspired by a lot of the restaurants that we were visiting. Um, and there was just so much creativity and exciting things happening, we really wanted to pay tribute to that. Um, and so the, all of the animals, characters themselves are animals that you find in the, the neighborhood of Canterbury. Um, and so yeah, so that was kind of the, the big concept. We wanted the flavor name itself to really stand out and the balls themselves. Uh, the labels to complement the, the soda color, because the colors are all natural, they're coming from the fruits themselves and we think they're really beautiful, we're really proud of those colors. So we wanted to uh, kind of accentuate all that. Here's one last question for Dr. Wyman here to wrap us up. Uh, guys, this is a, for me, it's a really inspiring story of entrepreneurship. I wonder, do you have a, a dream in five years' time or an exit strategy of where you'd like to go? The question is, do we have a, a dream of where we want to be in five years' time or an exit strategy? Um, I don't know about the exit strategy. I'm not sure that we would ever sell, but um, I think we want to be in the right position in five years where we're We've definitely talked about we want a bigger facility that can get to X amount of growth and we want to be up and down the East Coast into a bunch of different grocery stores we want to have. Um, also in restaurants and bars up in that area. And then I think, what else? Yeah. Um, so kind of speaking to what Matt said, um, we 
there's a very clear path for us. Retail is where we're going to scale the, the fastest. Restaurants are great for building awareness, um, and the kids are, they have great margins, but really to be able to scale and grow the brand quickly, retail is the play for that. And so over the next two years, we want to expand uh, uh, the entire East Coast. And then with the relationship through chain retailers like Whole Foods and uh, Kroger and HEB, um, these large regional and national grocery chains, we're, we'd like to grow into those to, within five years, be uh, in the entire United States. So it's really good. I think a good strategy is to build the business as if in the future someone might want to buy it. As in, don't build it so so niche with your own processes that nobody could ever repeat. Like think about uh, if I had to teach this to somebody else, could I possibly teach it to somebody else? Uh, so that you can you just kind of leave it open and write the book on how to do it. Well, Ashley's going to come up. Uh, what we do is we usually like to wrap our event uh, by asking for some quick real reflections. You'll find out that as part of what we do on a weekly basis, whether it be in my class or Dr. Juan Alfonso, is to ask you what are the three things you have learned. So, who wants to start us? What are three things you have learned today? Raise your hand. There's no wrong answer here. You're so shy. Yes. You don't have to have figured it out. You should maybe think about some planning, but you don't necessarily have to have all, all it figured out. Yes? Find mentors and get feedback. Find mentors, as you heard, the feedback is key, as resourceful, as useful, and I'll ask what Don't be afraid to outsource to experts if it's in a field that they have more experience in. So beyond the mentors, get the expertise, outsource it, minimize your time and cost so you can focus on some of the activities. So all these things are important in understanding. I also want to, before we do the closing, acknowledge actually an alum. So we actually have Eliza here, Zara from Alstrak. Uh, so she's also, you know, a lot of people here about retail, it's actually the very opposite. So Eliza, for some of you, if you're looking for vegan, amazing ice cream, it's right around the corner. Uh, Alstrak ice cream is, uh, and she actually was one of our, she's on the School of Business's uh, video, so her and her husband started a business, came from New York, and chose Charleston and started, and actually funny enough, the product uh, from Canterbury is featured as one of the actual products uh, made available there, so uh, we appreciate uh, Eliza for coming here and hearing, so she's trying to bring it back and connect with some of the entrepreneurs, so actually we're gonna go ahead and close up for us. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, we wanted to thank you, uh, the School of Business and the College of uh, Charleston students for coming and sharing your story, and we had dozens for you. Um, so if you guys could join me in thanking them for a good time.